So welcome everyone um, to the fifth in uh, a series of five events that the Global Urban History Project has been coordinating with a number of our wonderful um, collaborators. And uh, this one is called Critical Temporalities. Uh, Rosemary Wakeman will be um, speaking with Stefanos Gerolamos and uh, Deepesh Chakrabarti um, and uh, having a, well, you'll, she'll, she'll explain uh, how the event is gonna go. I just wanted to say a few things about um, the series. First of all, we, uh, the Global Urban History Project has held a series of um, conversations, we call them dream conversations over the past three and a half years or so. And um, this is a kind of culmination of one phase of that, uh, a series called Narrating Urban Lives that's been going on since uh, February. And um, our partners are wonderful in every way and have all played huge roles in, in bringing this to you. Um, for example, Critical Urbanisms at the University of Basel, Utadu at, uh, in Nairobi, um, the Urban Institute in, um, in uh, Antwerp and uh, Beyond Habitation Lab. Uh, so we're we we're very very grateful for everyone's um, assistance in putting in putting this on. Um, this is a, in a format that we've uh, chosen as one of our many formats. Um, this is a very easy way, a very cheap way for people on all continents to join us, more or less, when we can. Um, so we've uh, embraced it as a as a, a way of, of having conversations. And uh, we also will be um, following up with an announcement about an in-person conference that we hope this conversation and others that have gone on will um, inspire you to um, think about a, a panel uh, and, an, and applying for um, a spot in that, in that conference. More information will be coming on that uh, soon. It will be held with another of our wonderful partners, Center for Metropolitan Studies, in Berlin at the, uh, the Technical University of Berlin. I see Dorothee Brantz here who will be hosting us there. Thank you, Dorothee, for everything. It's really wonderful. Um, and we, um, so we'll have more information about that and how you can uh, apply to be part of that um, in the upcoming weeks. I'm gonna pass it on to Rosemary to um, announce today's event and to explain a little bit of how she hopes to proceed. Good. Thanks, Carl, very much. Um, I, I'm going to just start uh, very briefly for, for those of you who are joining us for the first time or just reminding us all what the Narrating Urban Lives series has been about. Uh, it began, um, at, its origins are in a conversation that the Global Urban History Project had around urban theory. Um, and we continue the discussion at uh, Leicester at uh, a conference last year. Uh, that was sponsored by the Urban History Journal on, for their 50th anniversary. So this has been a continuing conversation of one kind to the next. Some of the topics that we've covered so far um, are um, world making, urban undersides, archival futures, city and planet. And in this last uh, episode is critical temporalities. And I'm completely delighted to um, be uh, to have with us Stefanos Gerolanos um, and hopefully Dipesh Chakrabarti. I have emailed him and so hopefully he, he comes in here at some point. Uh, but in any case, we do need, need to get started. And Stefanos is the director of the Remark Institute and a professor of history at New York University. His most recent book just published, The Invention of Prehistory, Empire, Violence, and Our Obsession with Human Origins. I had the pleasure to listen to listening to a blog about it. Uh, it's an absolutely wonderful book. Um, and I also wanted to mention, especially in relation to our topic, the edited 2020 collection, Power and Time, Temporalities in Conflict and the Making of History that was done with Dan Edelson and Natasha Wheatley. Um, so, uh, with that, Stefanos, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, that we've organized uh, the, this workshop into two large questions. Um, the first one is by far the broadest, and that is what is critical temporality. 
uh, what is at stake in the notion. And um, I'm going to ask our speaker and speakers, hopefully, what role it plays in their own work and how they reflect, how they can reflect on the way uh, critical temporalities are imagined uh, in relation to historical time, particularly at this juncture in 2024, when we are faced with obviously the climate crisis and the focus on the Anthropocene, um, even what constitutes humanity and humanism as we're also faced with artificial intelligence. So we know uh, through the good work that has been done by Stefanos, by Deepesh, by uh, many others, that there are very different scales of time how do we measure these by his, as historians? How do we imagine the junctures, the disjunctures, the ruptures in time, the periodization that we provide? We also know that there are very different temporal experiences across the globe. Uh, so that putting critical temporality in a global context has been essential to our conversation. Um, so given those new realities and the way we practice history, do categories such as ancient and um, industrial, pre-industrial, even something like modern, postmodern, do they make any sense? Even something more recent, the great acceleration. Um, to a great extent, temporality has been largely unchallenged by historians. We're using the same parameters, the same framework. So how can we rethink that or do we need to rethink that? So I'll start there with that larger question. Uh, Stefanos, if you can, you know, give us your ideas and reflections very informally for about 10 minutes or so, and then we're going to break into conversation and, and discussion. That's great. Thank you so much, Rosemary. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. It's, I'm never sure with this thing. Um, so thank you, first of all, it's very kind of you to invite me and thank you for the very kind introduction. Uh, thank you all for being here. I'm, I'm sorry Depeche isn't here, at least not yet. Uh, he would be much more fun. And I think would, we would probably have slightly, uh, um, let's say we would be operating at the subject at an angle. So I do hope that he, he comes in um, to see. So um, critical temporality is not a term that I have ever used before and in the, um, first, I thought that it was kind of fun that in the first search that uh, I went, uh, that I tried out online, uh, critical temporality is a term that's used in science fiction and in phenomenology as a, as a way of blending critique and time. And uh, I wouldn't dismiss either of these uh, versions, uh, but if possible, I'd like to see if I can reapproach it a little bit from where. Um, I, from where we usually came from, from where we largely came from in this project on power and time. Um, so the reason for this is ultimately that maybe it's possible to reconstruct such a concept from a little bit from the outside. The way that I, that we understood, I don't think I'm speaking for the uh, co-editors, much less the authors of the book, but I will try a kind of vague we because we co-signed the introduction of this. Um, the way that we understood the main discussions by historians on time was that uh, historians had three generally broad models for working on the subject. Uh, a much more German and Scandinavian based model um, relies on the work of Reinhard Koselleck um, and largely and his collaborators in the Geschichtliche Grundbegriffe project uh, and largely at least in Koselleck's early work had very much to do with understanding the period 1650 to 1850 as a sort of congealment of modernity as a period of acceleration as a congealment of the main concepts uh, that determine um, temporality in, in modern life. Um, we thought that that was productive, but somehow a little too uh, stuck into a single uh, schema. The schema basically worked as though things speed up and as though they reach uh, the 1850s and from there on they're largely congealed in the relationship between state, society, time, uh, and so on. The effect of this was that by the time that Kosalek was writing, uh, this he, by the time that he was writing, he himself understood this schema to be in deep crisis, in a deep global crisis, if not in a sort of Schmittian global civil war. Um, so we thought that that was rather unproductive as a schema for operating with how we think about time now. A second version 
is a motif that's based much more on the history of the 18th, 19th, late 18th than 19th and uh, much of the 20th century is a history of revolutions. Uh, that is, that focuses on the more disruptive aspects um, of, you know, new forms of temporality or of crises and, and temporalities. And we thought that that's productive too, but it then kind of conversely doesn't work nearly as uh, effectively when you're trying to handle broader systems um, and let's say the multiplicity of temporalities in a uh, given social setup. And then third, since uh, Tim Mitchell's questions of modernity, if not since Johannes Fabian's um, time and the other, uh, the sense that um, imperial and colonial encounters involve the imposition of a Western time uh, onto, you know, the, uh, on the colonized has been quite uh, clear. The, the Fabian argument leads to a claim that, you know, this is all basically non coeval, uh, that people who, you know, share space and time and physical reality uh, conceive each other as existing non coevally. Uh, that is to say, as existing almost in different time frames, and one time frame being, of course, far more powerful than the other. I think that those three uh, classical scenarios all relied on a kind of geological metaphor of, of temporal regimes imposing themselves one on the other, uh, and in the disruptive revolutionary case, sometimes disrupting them. So the the goal in power and time was to accentuate both continuity and conflict, and to come up with a model that would be useful both for um, scholarly work, especially for historians and for critical work. Um, that model we called chronosynosis on not a geological basis, but a much more, um, let's say, biological metaphor. Um, biosynosis conventionally refers to the coexistence of uh, different kinds of organisms within a given space and the competition that kind of automatically uh, exists in that space between them. It doesn't mean that it's an absolute competition. Many of them cohabit. Many others compete among themselves. Uh, I mean, it's kind of easy to have a kind of fantasy jungle into which to uh, to place this, uh, this idea. Uh, since the 1970s, pathosynosis is similarly a concept used in pathology to describe the coexistence and sometimes the appearance of new diseases. Um, so that, again, within a certain framework, ostensibly we think of the uh, a particular environment as, an, as a, I don't want to say disease-ridden space, but it's, it's a space in which many um, types of pathogens coexist and sometimes compete with one another. We thought that, in a way, uh, chronosynosis is much the same thing. It uh, involves far more contestation than either of the three models that I referred to earlier, and I'll say just very, very quickly why. Uh, and it assumes no subjective position and no linear temporality, not this, this sense of what we experience as a movement, as a kind of flat movement forward, which is so deceptive in uh, studying time. Now, the idea from our perspective was that in moments of uh, political conflict or political crisis, um, think of the French Revolution, for example, um, suddenly you have both, you have a breakdown in the um, hitherto clear temporal order. The different temporal regimes, let's say, legal time, economic or financial time, a kind of everyday time, political claims on time, attempts to reorganize time, attempts to rethink the past, to rethink categories of the past, and so on. Um, in a moment of crisis, they, these this kind of conflict erupts, but it doesn't mean that it's not there before, it's just there more quietly. Um, so, and it doesn't mean that it doesn't get, you don't get some sort of flat seeming or more comfortable seeming time, but that, that is, let's say, the counter. Um, it's, it's, so if temporal regimes coexist, which is something relatively, um, commonly argued, let's say, in all this uh, writing about historical time, the idea would not be to see how they coexist, but how they at times conflict and, and compete with one another. If you think of the French Revolution, this is a very um, straightforward uh, argument that, that, that one can set up. You could think of the more, um, so you can think that by, you know, the end of 1789, the old regime is already called Ancien Regime, uh, with a clear tendency to drag it further back into the past. Uh, there is a, 
suggestion that year zero uh, or year zero of freedom has either happened and then that, that suggestion comes up again and again for the next couple of years until it's decided as uh, year zero in the revolutionary calendar. Uh, we have arguments, for example, Tocqueville's that very much did not actually change at all in uh, the structure of the French state for a number of years. We have attempts at the legal reorganization of the French state, the juridical reorganization of the French state. Uh, and then we have a whole series of utopias of claims to the new man, of claims to competitions or of, you know, um, a kind of who gets to control time. So um, that would be one scenario. The second scenario for me is something that we had more as an inside joke with, with Dan Edelstein and, and Natasha Wigley as we we're uh, finishing the book, which is that we basically finished this book in 2018. It was due to come out in early 2020, and in practice, it came out a year later. As if, so to speak, to demonstrate our point, uh, COVID was a, an extraordinary experience of this sort of fragmented temporality in which some things continued, some things moved into a really pathological kind of existence. Most of our lives were profoundly disrupted, and uh, were re and their, let's say, their time their, their main temporalities were replayed at a different uh, level, very often online and so on. Then as we were, uh, as the book was due out, suddenly, you know, there was a whole crisis uh, from all the printers. Printer paper didn't exist and the printer paper was on ships coming to the US, but this, they were not reaching because then there was the subsequent crisis. So all of these modes of disruption and continuity are what uh, we had the most in mind. From my perspective, it is really important to think of temporality as always already fractured, as not belonging to some sort of particular subject or not having some, um, some, some easy linearity. Uh, and as something where uh, the critical dimension comes in, let's say in scholarship and trying to identify multiple different uh, regimes trying to understand the differential reassembly of everyday life or the uh, ways in which different elements both produce continuity and appear at times to disrupt it. Uh, and in a, in a more critical dimension, it has very much to do uh, with the question of how do we avoid any sort of uh, gigantic narrative by using something of a model. Um, we refer to this in the book not so much as a model, as a you know, again, sort of uh, more playfully as a tesseract, as a kind of system from which you don't expect it to ever actually function uh, in three-dimensional reality, uh, but you can take elements of it and work with them uh, in relation to one another. Um, from this perspective, I think you can see why, to go back to Rosemary's question, from our sense, scales, temporal experience, categories, and so on, have to be basically rethought in every single study. Uh, as we go. It isn't simply what people report as their experience of time, but also what they would be seeing as anything from kinship structures to uh, juridical organization to moments of crisis to the thinking of, um, you know, um, thinking of death and, and, and so on. One of the most remarkable books that I read while we were preparing Power and Time uh, was in fact a study of temporality and dreaming in island Greece, uh, I think by Charles Stewart called Dreaming and Island, uh, uh, Dreaming and Temporal Consciousness in Island Greece. Uh, so these, that could not plausibly be uh, easily connected to work we would see um, somewhere, Dreaming and Historical Consciousness, not finally it's clicking on an island Greece. Um, so it's not that a model would actually simply function in different locations, but that different proddings, let's say, would give access to different ways of understanding concepts of time and structures and experiences of it. I'm, I worry that I've gone on for way too long already, so I should just uh, stop. No, thank and you so much, Stefanos. That uh, starts us off uh, extremely well. I, I just want to take a moment and say that Depeche is with us. Oh, great. Um, great. Um, so um, I think Carl, he is here. Okay. Um, um, yeah, let me uh, let me continue. I actually don't see the Pesha's. So his Pesha. screen is on, but there's no um, no audio, no video. Okay, uh, we'll see if we 
yeah, I'm going to I'm going to continue with Stefanos's remarks here because they uh, they were so rich and uh, you know I think um, we need to start our own discussion. There were a couple of two or three things that came out of this for me, uh, especially the last remarks that you mentioned, um, and the work that's been done on ghostly pasts. You were mentioning dream mm -hmm. states. Um, and I think the idea of the ruins of the past, ghostly ruins or ghostly past that continue um, in this sort of layered notion of uh, time and who controls and who invents yeah. those ideas are, are really worth looking at, particularly in relation to cities, I think. Um, it's a, it's a, a good way of, of looking at things. Um, so that's one idea that I had. I'm going to turn it over in, a, in just a moment. The second was the extraordinary fracturing of time in the 19th and 20th century, although modernity seems to be linear and also and that there is this, uh, you know, ideal of progress and an abstracted ideal of progress. The reality is, is that we have these extraordinary breaks at the French Revolution, um, other revolutions, the First World War, the time before the war, the time after the Russian revolutions, new man, right, you know, and the utopian ideal of communism, year zero at 1945, um, my most hated moment in history, I hate 1945 as the break. Um, so you know that it's you know it's a it's a fractured reality that um, the the question is as you've said does this make any sense anymore for for us to to look at it and particularly that way um, I'm going to see if we can get uh, Depesh with us but in the meantime um, do we have questions or comments from uh, from our very esteemed and large audience here as well. To give everyone a little bit of time, I'm very happy to say that the, the bit that you say about uh, ghostly pasts, uh, as well as the urban dimension of this, to me, seem utterly essential. Uh, Dorothy, do you want to go ahead and I will hold off the thought? Go ahead. Go ahead uh, and Dorothy. then I'll ask. Yeah. yeah. Um, go ahead, Stefanos, uh, and then I'll oh, ask my question. I mean, I, would, I think that I would have just said that you know, it's it's. I think Berlin is actually a, a spectacular example and a very visible example of of multiple different paths being relayed uh, relayed one on on top of of the other. Uh, I'm thinking particularly of the uh, of the building of the difference between five and six floor buildings as to whether these are pre-war or post-war that you can actually identify on the basis of the the, the general shared height, as though you can kind of see a geography of bombing with it, a geography of a moment of, of collapse of, and then of multiple forms of reconstruction uh, across time. Um, I grew up in Athens, so you can imagine what version of, you know, a kind of decline of the late 19th century version of the city and of even the 20s and 30s version uh, of Athens itself, but then with multiple disruptive directions. Um, uh, came in to say nothing of 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 ancient Athens, which is physically beneath the 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 feet of everyone who tries to dig to do something, even to build a new uh, building. Uh, but with that again and again and again would belong with multiple other, you know, superimposed mappings of time, let's say, into uh, into everyday life um, and into the way that the city would. Uh, would end up being conceptualized. I'm a big fan of Ethan Kleinberg's uh, book, Haunting History. So this links back to what you were just saying on, on ghostly past, on versions that are all but invisible, but then kind of keep reappearing uh, and producing different uh, forms of experience and different forms of, uh, of time here. Yeah, I wonder too if, if if that idea of these scales and different layers of history, some of them ghostly and ruins, are also related to the idea of both possession and dispossession of time. Oh, absolutely. Um, so that your idea of power, power and the of the conflicts, the conflictual nature of of time and power, really comes into play here um, yes. in terms of the idea of both possession, who controls time, and who lacks control, who is dispossessed of, of time and remain floating right in this sort of nether world of dreams of a dream state of of uh, ruins or of ghost of a ghostly past yes absolutely absolutely i think the easiest thing is to say i completely agree with exactly everything you said i'm so glad <laughs> um, no because it's rarely um, do people agree with <laughs> no but it, i mean it's i i tend to think that there's um in, in versions of dispossession i think 
that is perhaps the most obvious scenario. There is a sense of uh, a kind of thinning out, let's say, of a present and a replacement of a present with 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 alien objects or orders or structures. And then at the same time, there's various ways in which the future becomes a, a kind of closed uh, or appears ever more to be a closed structure. To say nothing of traditions that are deemed illegitimate, um, of objects that are removed. I mean, think uh, the entire museum, uh, the entire museum debate uh, about the restitution of objects, objects that have uh, life and meaning and generate continuity. Not to mention veneration and um, commitment. I'm not committed to the the words that are just used, but just as heuristics for um, in this. But objects that ought to be restituted for those versions, as opposed to objects generated for the uh, constant reproduction of tourism to, um, you know, major cities with many other objects of indifferent, you know, of, of peculiarly, um, peculiarly attributed value um, and, uh, you know, e easily replaceable. Um, so that would be an easy reference frame. Yeah, the question is, is how we deal with this as historians and writing and rewriting um, history in the 21st century. Um, Depeche is, is with us. Uh, Depeche, um, have, do you have your audio on? Let's see if we can ask him. He's, he was having trouble with his audio, so he is he is here. A technical um, issue that I can't quite figure out. Um, I made him host, so Depeche, if you can hear me, you should be able to control your fate, but I'm not sure about that. You've been having trouble um, changing any of the settings. Okay, in the meantime, questions from the audience. Thank you, Dorothy, for yours. Okay, yeah, uh, I think I have a general question for our discussion maybe, uh, because I totally agree with you, uh, Stefanos, that temporalities are fractured um, and uh, you know we have to think about uh, difference differentiation uh, at the same time I keep wondering how do we then you know sort of uh, find a common ground from which we can you know sort of articulate a common idea about history for instance or about the field of urban history uh, something that we can then also talk to with students um, and that we can have a common conversation. Because if we keep saying just as we do in every field, right, um, mm -hmm. everything is fractured, everything has to be differentiated, everything, you know, is about uh, diversification, um, which I totally agree on. But then how do we come to, you know, sort of a common ground, something that we can talk about um, rather than just multiplying where the differences lie? Um, and so that's, I think, a general question for our discussion, um, mm -hmm. because I think, you know, you're absolutely right with your critique on Koselik, for instance, right? But one thing it did give us, it gave us something, you know, to read and something to position ourselves vis-a-vis, -vis, right? Um, yes. And, yes. and how do we do this now with, you know, we have so many different perspectives, um, and that's sort of a, a general concern of mine, and I just thought I'll ask it in this round here so because if you guys have the answer i would be thrilled to hear it so i mean i don't i don't exactly have an answer and i don't i wouldn't pretend to give an overarching account the way that i would say that i try to to uh teach temporal questions is if it's an overarching uh course i try to make it very i try to um let's say articulate major concepts and uh, metaphors and expressions as these appear in text that I'm, uh, let's say in primary text that I'm teaching over the period of this material and gradually begin to build on to, uh, to build onto that a kind of apparatus so that students can see a temporal, a set of temporal differences. My sense is that though there is a very large body of work on temporality in, uh, that's emerged in the last, mm -hmm. let's say, 20 what is very often the case is that temporality becomes a kind of easy language for discussing other problems. Uh, I think that that's fine if it's a structure of convenience or if it's a way of describing various forms of contestation or continuity. Um, but in a way, if we're simply translating those problems uh, into a new language, that's not going to help anybody too much. Um, so at stake is somehow, um, 
let's say, enabling students to read the language of time or the language of the experience of time, whether this is, let's say, in, um, I don't know, uh, in a novel uh, or if it is in a very, in, in minor documents. I can give, I suppose that I can give a couple of examples. Um, one would be, you know, so I still basically teach uh, a, a couple of versions of 20th century uh, of 20th century intellectual history. And then in, par in parallel to that, because of the prehistory book for a while, I was teaching versions of the um, uh, of, of that book as a class, to, as I was learning that, that material. In the 20th century intellectual history, I try to um, make the argument, you know, the, the text would be largely the same, but I try to bring out uh, the way in which authors from Gramsci and Jung, uh, let's say in the immediate uh, post-war period and the wartime and post-war period, through to, I don't know who I would um, pick for much later. Well, let's just say those two examples as plausible ways of describing not memory and not exactly history, but uh, a, a kind of um, temporalized experience. That would be the the sort of low level, if you will. Um, in the prehistory course, a lot of the work that I did had to do with something that Rosemary brought up before, versions of the modernity and progress narrative. Um, so particularly one thing that I cared about especially uh, was the way in which triadic forms of understanding time came to be uh, established in the 19th century. So Stone, Bronze, Iron Age, uh, where the Iron Age also is a metaphor for the Industrial Age. Um, and thereby you get a kind of antique temporality and then a kind of extended version. But then these translate into other triads of, you know, civilized versus quote unquote barbarians and quote unquote savages. And so you just get, I'm trying to remember what the third, uh, and the third one is the positivist understanding of time regarding uh, animism, religion, and science, for example. So in a way you suddenly get multiple languages that are playing this. And at stake is given the particular frame in which this would be examined. Again and again, it would have to be some scenario where students can excavate these kinds of temporalities or these kinds of temporal surprises first, and then the counter, um, you know, temporal continuities, rather than assume a kind of overarching uh, form. This isn't a very satisfactory argument, I'm afraid, but it's just more to say it is doable without this appearing as a general theory, but as a way of enabling a kind of diagonal reading of the same material that we would otherwise be uh, that we would otherwise be teaching. I can use other examples, but I'd rather wait and if Depeche can unmute at this point, maybe it's time to hear from him rather. Yeah, than... Carl is yeah. Carl is as busy working uh, with great energy trying to rectify this. Carl, are we having any luck? No? We'll see, yep. We have we have a bunch of different plans, so we'll see how it goes. Okay, um, thank you. So, um, yeah, I, you know, one of the questions here in terms of intellectual history in particular is, you know, I often think that, um, the, I often think about the work of Edward Said and Orientalism, right. in which um, he was he was able to, really dig into and excavate the construction of the East, right, in uh, in the intellectual world of academies and universities and institutions and geographic societies, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah. you know, the question is, is how, how our narrative, how that vocabulary that you've just been um, describing, Stefanos, gets, gets invented, gets created, and by whom, as historians, as professional historians, um, and uh, you know, I, where, where can we, how, how can we excavate the history of that, right, uh, quite specifically, and how do we overturn it, or to what degree do we need to overturn it? And also, I guess the last thing I would say, are are there intellectuals in the global South um, that could aid us with this, you know, to provide a different rendering, a different narrative intellectually um, to pause it alongside, to parallel, to overturn um, that that's been created in the, in the West. These so, are just open questions, but uh, go ahead, Stefanos. I wanted to ask as well if we have any questions or comments from the audience. 
Alexia. Yeah, I mean, sorry, Rosemary, um, you just, those are such important questions. I don't want to distract from them, but I suppose just a point following on the conversation that we were just having, uh, maybe pushing it a little bit uh, in a more explicit direction. I'm, I'm interested to know if, in the examples you were giving, um, Stefanos, of, of what we could be doing in a classroom, for instance, I mean, is, is the conception here that uh, you know, sort of learning or teaching students or thinking about different temporal registers and thinking about them in a way that I think as you're trying to tell us in chronosynosis, which is more about, right, it's really a more kind of power drenched way of thinking about time as well than most of us tend to, mm -hmm. right? Like this mm -hmm. is the, that's the, the, the emphasis on competition, as it were. Is this sort of one thing amongst others that we could be doing with our historical documents, right? And we could be doing that in classroom. Like you would read this for, like here's a source. You would read it for, you know, gender relations. You would read it for, um, you know, expressions of racial hierarchy. You can also read it to think about time um, and how time is working and who it's helping and who who doesn't get to access um, kind of that legitimate legitimizing authority or whether that's something that's relevant at all. Um, or is it something that as historians, we need to be, I don't know, sort of moving it more to the center of our methodology, um, it kind of in a different way, right? So I, I suppose what I'm asking about is, is this notion that this is supposed to be something that we as historians are better equipped to do than others, um, which which is not really necessarily true in my experience, though. Um, it's something we talk a lot about at Global Urban History as well, because we're often talking with practitioners who aren't that interested in deep time. Um, sure. And we're trying to convince them that it's something that they should be thinking about. Um, and we'd like to, like, you know, expand our ability to, like, make that argument really, per like, kind of persuasively, like, right, you know, how does history matter? Um, so yeah. I suppose my the general question is, is. Yeah, I suppose is it is it one tool that we have and one thing we can be looking for, or is there something more uh, kind of foundational that needs to change in the practice, or um, kind of move more to the core of what we do? Um, if if that's uh, clear, I mean, so I think from my perspective, um, if it's okay for me to take these two, Dorothy, and, and uh, as these were both really difficult questions, so I do think that this is important to have. A central practice, but it sort of depends on how one. It really depends on how one reads, um, and so you know, I'm basically trained in philology. Um, I'm trained. Uh, I have a much more comparative literature-based uh, training with a lot of, um, you know, many <laughs> many years in graduate school uh, for deconstructive readings of of very particular texts here and there, uh, and I rely on this a great deal because a lot of the time. I'm not, you know, it's not even about reading for time as one would read for gender. It's about trying to understand what words appear antiquated in the text, what versions of this, uh, what kind of forward moving claim is being made here and what way is the present emptied out in a particular um, form or, or other. So to, I would give one example. I hope this uh, works out with Depeche. It must be like super frustrating to hear and not, not be. Um, quite here. So, in one for one example, um, and also I did want to say one thing, uh, two things. One, to um, uh, what you were asking about, Rosemary. I I'm a fan of uh, Akila uh, Akil Mbembe's uh, on the post yeah. colony, on temporality and and on the sense again of past that uh, haunt. Uh, on intellectual history, as far as I'm concerned, uh, intellectuals are any and all who speak. And, um, you know, I basically, I feel like I come from a field in which for a very long time, it has been the case that we have a few famous intellectuals and that's great. But a lot of the time, so long as somebody speaks, that is an adequate uh, um, premise because one can study precisely what it is that comes into their uh, forms and arguments. So in my own work, I had two occasions in which temporality appeared very, very bluntly. One version is in a project on the body in World War I. Uh, and then um, that had to do with a sense of physical shock uh, as this is experienced by soldiers who have, you know, minor bullet wounds, but end up dying of shock. What, we, what you know, what like ER style shows still describe as like, she went into shock, for example. Um, that sort of scenario, all of the attempt to understand it relied on fundamentally different temporalities. Was it some version of, to, um, you know, did particular injuries lead to toxic reactions in the body, which then 
followed particular, um, you know, organic si organ systems into collapsing one after the other, or the theory that um, ended up, you know, uh, or the theory that ended up winning, uh, did the body try to hide the blood, there, therefore slowing itself down and gradually kind of collapsing in on itself system by system by system. That was just about how, you know, basically doctors at the front and physiologists in London tried to construct a sense of how the body itself reacts, but also how then you move toward treatment uh, within how long do you have to do A, B, or C? Um, how does the particular location of the injured uh, influence the way in which they experience this kind of thing? So suddenly you have like elaborate schemas of, you know, Army Medical Corps location on the front, relationships between central authorities and local authorities, and so on as to how you proceed to treat. The second example that I would give has to do with uh, French civil code. And uh, when the Conseil d'État, the, the Council of State, um, met after Napoleon, uh, you know, decreed that a first draft would be written by four jurists, and they met in order to have the preliminary conversations, the very first problem that they had to confront was a problem of time. Does the law come into action the moment that it's been promulgated in Paris? Does it radiate out of Paris? So it's 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 actually plausible that you would be, I don't know, in Marseille. And because it takes a week for, you know, all details to arrive, you wouldn't actually have uh, information on that law. Did you break that law in that sense? Does the law have to wait in Paris so that the entire uh, country can first be informed of the law for this to happen? That's a major issue because it played out on questions of transparency, on juridical equality, on you know the relationship between Paris as, as a capital and the centralization of power and so on. So both of the examples that I'm giving in this, and Napoleon was like particularly agitated in this. He would constantly talk about whether this offends the majesty of the national will, which usually means his, uh, but nonetheless is phrased as other things. So you can find this material in the expressions of people who had been minor lawyers suddenly, I mean, Portalis and, and Tonchet were not minor lawyers, but the others were, uh, and councillors of state who were what? Basically, you know, selected, hand-selected some of them in order to basically say yes. So suddenly the question of what constitutes an intellectual goes from the nurse at the front who comments on the availability and the regularity with which they are provided with, um, I don't know, eating bla uh, blankets that they can heat in order to keep a patient who's going cold from dying, how regularly and how many they need to be receiving, all the way up to, um, you know, let's say Napoleon's lawyers and him himself. So I think it's about really picking, treating as intellectuals pretty much anyone uh, and trying to figure out how those kinds of articulations um, give us chances for, uh, for you know, watching what the experience of time for particular people speaking is, or what the the imposition of a temporal order uh, looks like, um, in you know, from like the from yours and my experience to the experience of of temporal order as imposed in a system that was meant to last forever, and actually has kind of lasted two hundred and twenty years. So, um, you know. Okay, Sorry that this well, keeps going so long. What, what happened with uh, what happened with the patch? Um, we're still Carl. Can you update us at all? I think this is oops territory now. Yeah. Carl, can you so, turn your audio on? You have. Sorry, yeah, I've been running around to different screens. Um, we are trying our best. That's all I can okay. say. Lots All of right. there must be some some glitch on his computer we don't understand and uh, so he may try with his phone we'll we'll see how it goes if okay. it works out I'm very happy to stay quiet from here on his yeah you know, okay great yeah um, I think we have a question I have a hand up from Dorothy 
Yeah, if anyone else has a, a question or a comment, you know, please yeah. please do. I'm just trying to keep, you know, the conversation going. So uh, as soon as we can have the technical problems resolved, uh, I guess all of us will be happy to stop. Uh, but uh, but I think, uh, Stefano, that's like totally fascinating what you just said, because you pointed both towards temporality as a discursive category, right, in mm -hmm. a sort of legal context, but also as a physical experience uh, when we think about the bodies, right? So... Um, and I think it's these two dimensions that operate, you know, sort of according to different, uh, as Alexa said, temporal registers, right? So, um, and and I thought it was really interesting, Alexa, what you said, that you think, you know, sort of historians are the ones who know how to talk about time or, you know, then you sort of uh, relativize it right away. Because I think what we often do is we assume that you know we sort of use the category of temporality but i think what we often do is we use it just in a chronological sense even if we break down yeah. you know sort of notions of different epochs and and so forth um but that we tend to operate more on this discursive level and you know sort of maybe don't consider the the physical dimension enough um and i can just say from my perspective as an urban environmental historian uh when i look with students at urban temporalities uh they talk about history they talk about memory they you know but they they don't come up to think about i don't know traffic lights for instance um and all kinds of rhythms um and these things that are imposed then to schedule our behaviors right mm -hmm. so um and that are operate maybe on a little bit of a different level um and for instance i work on seasons and how seasons influence you know sort of urban dynamics um and and i think these are somewhat different temporalities that are often overlooked by historians because we think in terms of you know chronologies whatever that means to us right so yes, um, yes. Yes. So I, I I would say, and with a body, it's very tricky, right? Because on the one hand, yes, it is an experience. And at the same time, it's a discursively conditioned experience in more ways than one. You know, let's say um, somebody who understands themselves as a, you know, psychoanalytically educated self would see different periods of formation um, about their very, their very, behavior and existence, a different moments in formation is as more important than somebody who thinks in terms of emotions or affects or, or other things. Then uh, what you said about rhythms a second ago, I think that's um, I think that's exactly right. How do we how and even again, power comes right into that scenario. What kind of rhythms uh, come to play uh, come to play a role? I think I had a um, wave of um, reverting back to an earlier point, which I'm sort of unsure of uh, right now. But yes, that sense of, of a kind of discursive and an experienced form um, seemed to me incredibly important in terms of how do we manage to um, negotiate how people talk to us about time. I think it's very important in many ways that we, you know, um, almost entirely avoid speaking of linear time um, or that we uh, avoid speaking of something that feels like grounded time. So of course I, you know, I got up in the morning, I took my kids to school, I came to the office. That was a kind of linear experience, but that was, that is what must absolutely be disrupted in order for me to say, I used the subway, I, um, you know, I followed on the basis of what their growing up uh, is going to be like and the regularities that the kids need. Uh, I, the economic and other structures that come into the story and then my need to be at the office for work and also for uh, speaking with you. It's, if we, I think that the, the linear or easily experienced continuous time is a non-starter. Uh, that treats something that is aesthetically fused as something that's natural. Okay, Depeche is here, and it's time for me to shut up. <laughs> yes, Depeche is here, um, and we're absolutely delighted. Depeche, uh, apologies for all the technical glitches, uh, but well, victory is had, and you're you're with us. And we've yeah. had really a quite interesting discussion here on temporality, on critical temporality, and what it means for Stefanos's work, and in general for historians.
Um, so you've come in uh, at a, a great time. If you'd like to take just a few moments to talk about how critical temporality has infused your own work, uh, particularly in relation to your your uh, recent books on One Planet, Many Worlds, The Climate Parallax, and also The Climate of History in a Planetary Age. I think we all know Depeche, but just very quickly, he is Distinguished Professor of History at the University of Chicago. Welcome, Depeche. Thank you, Rosemary. <laughs> My apologies. I don't know what was going wrong, and you know, I was trying several things, and I could hear you, and, and, and I was very frustrated having to leave the meeting, come back in and again, and kind of Miss sentences, miss discussions, but what I did hear of Stephanus was absolutely fascinating. Um, can you hear me all? You can hear me all right. Yes. right? Okay, yeah. good. Thanks, thanks. Just just a quick, you know, um, uh, quick thoughts, uh, which I hope will make sense. Um, so first of all, um, temporality was more critical to my work than the idea of critical temporality. Yeah. So, so, in but in some ways, uh, time became um, a part of the critique I was trying to develop from the time of provincializing Europe. Uh, actually, because uh, because um, this question of the time of chronology, and uh, which we don't experience as time. I mean, and when I was working on um, provincializing Europe, I was also uh, because of my under, sort of my interest in physics lifelong, and and because of my undergraduate major having been physics, um, I kept uh, talking to my physicist friends about whether uh, in their ideas there is something called time, and of course they all kept back and saying we don't know if there's time, but there's irreversibility. Uh, uh, things are going to go back, which has to do with the idea of entropy and things. And and to me, and uh, again, uh, other people, Hayden White, and of course Benjamin Nazareth have said it that that when I when I find at the end of a history book, kind of a timeline, say a world history book, and you get a year and you and the events are all narrated on a horizontal sort of axis, it's very clear that you think of every year or every now you mention as a kind of sack in which one can put all kinds of events. Whereas when an event happens, like the French Revolution or something happens that, that's significant to you, even your child's birth, uh, time clearly has a quality to it. So even when we talk about good times, bad times, best of times, worst of times, so there's, there's, it was obviously clear that there's a difference between the time of chronology and and the time that human beings experience. Now, again, you can go back again to um, uh, to various people, including Koselek, of course, to think about it. And uh, and and it was, and I was trying to run this opposition between this home, this what we think of as empty homogeneous time. Um, without which we can't create the before-after relationship between historical events. So in any historical explanation, the before-after relationship is very important. So it's not, and the before-after relationship is philosophically about the irreversibility of history, that you you don't, the Heraclitian the Heraclit point, that you don't step into the same river twice. Um, but at the same time, uh, you experience time differently both individually, collectively. And I was trying to run that opposition through Marx, through the time of capital. Um, what does it mean? And that's why I ended up with notions of history one, history two, um, trying to say that even when people get caught up in the logic of capital, uh, which is kind of where you narrate the story of capital's life, on the basis of a time that you assume can capture all events of the world. Uh, uh, otherwise, you wouldn't have a history of capitalism. Um, but within that, there is this question of how does one experience being part of what, what, what one calls capitalism? 
And that's an old question that the historian for me goes back to E.P. Thompson's The Making of the English Working Class, which is why he made the whole category experience as a historical category that um, Joan Scott and others would reflect back on, you know, its gendered nature, its discursively constructive nature, as Stephanos was saying, uh, all of those things. But, um, but then as I was reading Marx to see if one could run this opposition through Marx, I found actually uh, Marx is particularly the, in the Grundrisse and uh, the so-called the three volumes of theories of surplus value, which are basically a collection of his notes that uh, he does talk about a kind of uh, time that uh, can be appropriated by capital but doesn't belong to its life work. Uh, and that kind of made me think of these kind of two different notions of time getting always conjugated in the history of capital as also the problem of not just transition to capitalism, but also a problem of being translated into capitalism, almost sometimes translating yourselves in, into capitalism, into the categories of capitalism. And um, so, uh, and, and you will understand it because I see, I, I grew up um, as a child and then as a young adult in India, assuming that modernization was the goal of history. Uh, whether it was modernization of caste relationship, modernization of gender relationships, modernity and modernization. And, and one did not separate the infrastructure of modernization from the requirements of modernity. One did not think that you could actually become modern without setting up schools, without setting up universities, without setting up, uh, without reading Tom Paine. <laughs> so, so uh, you know, or Tocqueville for that matter. Uh, so, so when I came into the, as an apprentice into the profession of history under uh, the tutelage of some of my Indian professors who actually made a historian of me. I had done an undergraduate physics degree and then got an MBA from one of the two Indian business schools. Um, our, our histories were totally caught up in what was called transition to capitalism debates. And these were European debates in which uh, some Japanese uh, historians and theorists had participated, primarily European debates. Um, and we were trying to insert a, a history like India's non-Western history into that debate to understand the problems of our modernity. And that it's from that that the question of provincializing Europe arose, that 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 this Europe, which seemed at the same time so explanatory powerful, explanatorily powerful, so needed. And when I wrote that book, I was always um, see what had happened in the history of subaltern studies was that subaltern studies had gotten to a point where we met up with our anti-developmentalists like Ashish Nandi and others. And Partha Chatterjee's Nationalist Thought book had come out in 86. And we had held Enlightenment rationalism as the main culprit that distorted our lives. Uh, and so when I was writing Provincializing Europe, which was which came out good 14 years after Partha's book had come out, I was the first first thing I did was to ask myself, what would what kind of investment would the most oppressed person in India have in the European Enlightenment? And it wasn't hard to answer because if you read Ambedkar, who was from an untouchable background, who was one of the framers of the Indian Constitution. Um, and who was a complete antagonist, naturally, of what was thought of as the caste system. He clearly says somewhere that he wished Indian history would begin from 1789. And when I saw that, I knew that I could ne never be against the Enlightenment. At the same time, I also knew that this Enlightenment was my own. So there, kind of the, the Du Bois idea, idea of double consciousness, which you know later on in Rushdie's pen became the expression forked tongue, speaking through a forked tongue. And that, that became very important. And, and then reading Derrida, reading Deconstruction, reading um, um, Benjamin, the, 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 the tussle between this empty homogeneous time and messianic time uh, of the revolution, all these figures of the double, doubling of time uh, became critical. In, in 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 to the project of what provincializing Europe might mean, which I actually meant both owning Europe 
as my own heritage in my as my own inheritance as well as disowning it at the same time and realizing that you know this was i increasingly realized that this was not a west versus non west project because even within the west this ha this happens because the, the 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 europe that i had to own as my own was a very normative europe and whether you think of it yourself as individuals or whether you think of it as a group we always have differences with the norm and sometimes it gets historically instantiated like within europe the further east you go the more asiatic you become so the moment you know the i mean hitler's sort of contempt for the poles as peasants you know which 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 in some respect was kind of um, somehow imbibed by stalin himself uh, when you look at the massacres he carried on um you you realize that the even i mean in in england the irish or the welsh uh you know who are seen as somewhat laggards coming into modernity and i realized that provincializing the, that which is normative means that you can't give up on the question of the norm you can't give up on the question of the universal but at the same time this universal is never a complete description of who you are and what you are what your experiences are and that kind of doubling so, so whether it was du bois uh, double consciousness whether it was rushdie's folk tongue whether it was um, derrida's notion of time out of joint uh, i i realized that that the concept of provincializing europe was not a west versus non west uh, thing and and sometimes people don't people sometimes compliment me seeing me as an anti eurocentric person but they miss out on how centric how center central europe is to what i'm doing or some people just accuse me of eurocentrism missing out on the critical distance i'm also trying to create with that which is completely mine and this figure of being double this figure of being internally fractured this figure of but also at, at the same trying to hold the, the two together uh it really sort of came out in a chapter i wrote called on on minority history and subaltern pasts where i was trying to argue that even um when you think of describing a period that's totally you think is totally different from your period a period historical period from which you've experienced some kind of a rupture let's say um something that which is in a deep sense medieval um, you know carol carolin walker bynum's work for instance uh it becomes very it became clear to me that that and and this was a point being made theoretically by heidegger or uh by other hermeneutics that you can only begin the hermeneutic cir circle because you have a kind of foreknowledge of that which you are wanting to understand and 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 the fact that you have an imaginative access to somebody who comes from another culture another his another history completely different very as different as they can be that always begins the starting point of the interpretive hermeneutic circle so that so you so heidegger would call it having the, the four knowledge of the the knowledge it's like what gadamer calls prejudice the judgment you have of somebody or something before you've actually formally judged them so it's prejudice uh and so so i i realize that this is so in some ways this kind of um experience of doubleness with the with the norm kind of became my universal in provincializing here uh, and, and what was what was particular was of course the very universal itself in other words eventually in the chapter on capital i could argue that uh, that the universal is a form that becomes particular the moment you want to visualize it and the example i used to think of and give to my students sometime is that when not now not but in in uh, kind of anatomy classes when you wield in an actual skeleton of a human being but called it the human skeleton and it could perform the job of being the human skeleton only in the singular if it was there on its own you wield in another skeleton and that would look different on the other hand when i see a, a human being i know the form 
But the moment I have to concretely visualize a human being, something like that happened. Look, so whenever Europe or England said to the, or the English said to the Indians that, look at me, I am modernity. My, I realize that, that you can only say that in from the position of, an, of a usurper. You, you almost usurp the form and, and you conflate that with a, with a particular instantiation of it. Uh, but there was always a question, historically, there was a question before and after. So if somebody has claimed to be modern before you, um, uh, they raise for you this question of, you know, what Diotard once um, expressed by creating a distinction between the discursive and the figurative. In other words, let's say you, you, you think, I want to become modern, or I want to become liberal. Now, to the de degree that being liberal, being modern, is algorithmic, the same argument would apply almost anywhere. But, but on the other hand, if you ask, how do I visualize being a modern? What do I have to give up in order to be modern? So in my culture, what we gave up, which you, many of you wouldn't have had to give up in your culture, in my background, what we gave up was the practice of taking the dust of the feet of older people. Because we began to see it not as a gesture of respect, but as a gesture of hierarchy. And the whole question of visualizing being equal became this youthful rebellion. Like my father would, an uncle would come, my father would say, greet him by touching his feet. And I would say, no. My father would be upset, but I. But these emotional upset would be part of the figurative side of modernity. Like, how do you figure it? How do you visualize it? And so my argument was that the the concepts can be to the degree they're abstract can be can be, um, for instance, um, universal. And that's why concepts travel much more easily than the figurative aspects of of the same thing so so in but, but so in in many ways when i was writing provincializing europe and was trying to create room for these other histories of capital other histories of being modern the universal in effect was uh, kind of almost a phenomenological uh, ground of the of being human uh, where uh, Every human being is different from another human being, no matter what their color of skin or whatever. But and but that difference comes into play whenever you want, for good rational reasons, to institute the norm. Uh, so I was not giving up on the, I, on the idea of the normative, but trying to complicate our relationship, yeah. relationship to it. What this happened? is a good. This is a good uh, segue, I think, into our second question because. Uh, it's related specifically to the idea of a critical temporality as applied to urban history or to the city, which is really, the, you know, it's become the, the city is the metaphor for modernity, right? You know, and in every conceivable way, urbanization, urban planning, modern architecture, the material, literally the materiality of the city uh, has become a metaphor for how we imagine modernity. Um, so, Debesh, I, I, you know, I wonder if you've had a chance to reflect on on that for us as urban historians. I can also um, do my climate work with that. Yeah, thing. that's right, absolutely. And I think it's particularly interesting because um, space has taken over as a sort of a critical and analytical tool in uh, in urban history to a great extent, largely yeah. because of the good work of the critical geographers, right? So we know much about urban space. We know about spaces of capital, spaces of exclusion. Space, space, and space, and the the question is is where temporality um, is in that, and on, and I think it's it's an excellent segue to your work now on climate change as well. Let me make two points. Um, no, I I totally agree with you. It's a good good uh, moment to turn into that work and how it's different from provincializing Europe in that sense, uh, because the time question changed for me. Uh, so two things. Well, I mean, as you were speaking, I was thinking of you know the work of my colleague Neil Brenner, who is one of these critical geographers uh, uh, working on cities. But also I was thinking that um, that what the interesting thing that happened to my to my intellectual experience when I was working on climate change is that the universal for me shifted. So in provincializing Europe, if the phenomenological 
was kind of the universal. Uh, when I was doing the climate work, I became interested in deep history. And, uh, and this Arthur Whitehead question of whether or not everything was historical or Alden's question. And it came to me by reading a, a scientist on, on, on deep history of the brain. And, uh, and I realized that whereas in phenomenology, somebody like Heidegger would take uh, some basic moods like anxiety, boredom, as given to the human beings. In other words, these are as given to the human beings. This particular book was arguing that because the brain develops in modules, the history of the human brain, it's a the modular development, you can go back and identify the historical period in which that part of the brain in which we register boredom was added to our skull and it developed. So he suddenly made boredom not into a basic mood of design, but into a historical phenomenon, historicizable a phenomenon in the evolution of hominins and then, then the homo sapiens, if you took a deep historical view of things. So this whole question of time opened up for me. And 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 what seemed phenomenolog phenomenological also seemed evolutionary. The, the way I connected to the question of the cities is this way. See, my discovery of deep time, my personal discovery of this deep time, obviously it's been <laughs> discovered by many long, long before I did, um, came out of uh, my interest in planetarity and the planetary aspects of our lives. And one of the questions that arose for me, and it, it, I'm addressing it more in my current work than I have in the past, but I, 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 do, I have a brief discussion of it in the essay on the pandemic in the second book, uh, One World, Many Planets, sorry, One Planet, Many Worlds, um, where I, the chapter on the pandemic, uh, where I, I basically asked this question, what enabled us to marginalize things we call the weather and the seasons? Uh, in other words, if you were, if you lived in a, in an indigenous society, whether or the seasons would be critical to your existence. You know, if you were if you're in a peasant society, it would be similarly critical to your existence. You wouldn't survive without being aware of the work of the clouds and the work of the sun and the, all of those things. And I realized that our our distance, our cultural and experiential distance from the seasons, and therefore also weather begins with basically it's a function of two things urbanization and technology and you see it very clearly in infrastructure in the history of infrastructure so before the british came or even the wars in india were seasonal you know if a river was in full tide your elephant couldn't cross it uh, and you had to wait the rain sometimes you got your powder wet and you couldn't fight if you read description, the war, wars were seasonal, roads were seasonal, navigable only in particular seasons. One of the things that the British were very proud of building in India was the roads they called all-weather roads. When the railways were built, even Joseph Pierre Prundeau, you know, the, with whom Marx carried out that polemics in Poverty of Philosophy, wrote two extremely purple passages, which uh, my friend Pierre Chabonnet has reproduced in his book on uh, abundance, what does he call it? Abundance in something. Purple passage where Trudeau says, wonderful, now I can travel in any weather. I That I should be travel in any weather. That I should be able to bomb people in any weather. That I should be able to carry out a war, irrespective of the season and the weather. Now, this has been the story of technology and very minor personal thing is that I grew up in India knowing mangoes to be a summer fruit only available in summer. Now, thanks to <laughs> air conditioning and other things, I eat mangoes the year, year round. So I, I look on the problem of cities as a, you know, it not simply as the cultural problem of the city and the country that Raymond Williams wrote about, and, and the country being extremely formative of urbanisms in many places, right? I mean, the, the pastoral in the city, all of those questions, have you? But actually, I, I now think of, the, the city and technology together as having produced uh, 
this it's produced a lot of things it's produced a certain kind of distancing from death uh, but distancing from wild animals uh, I mean, if I mean, I was shocked to hear the other day that in the that we have the metro lines just close to where I live, and that in the embankment of these rails there are coyotes that eat the urban rabbits. I was just shocked to know that the coyotes are so close to my existence. You know, I mean, in the Chicago suburbs you see them all all, all the time, uh, and you have to caref be careful with young children. But you see, but but. Cities have taken the very basic principle of the very basic political principle of secur securitizing human life to an extreme from 17th century on, to an extreme where basically we have securitized human life by co constantly eliminating the risk posed by wild animals, so that you get to a point where only the microbes are your predators. Uh, nothing else can really get to you. But also technology has produced this alienation from the seasons and the weather, which I now think of as in a Heideggerian vein as the forgetting of the planetary. Because otherwise I think human history, humans were always aware of the work of the planet. Uh, it comes out, you know, even in Robin Wall Kimmerer's book, Braiding Sweetgrass, where she talks about her her tribal history and, and her tribe, she talks about something that I know as my memory of my family having been having once lived in a peasant society. Societies are full of injunctions. Don't go there, you know, don't do do that. And a lot of them has to do with dealing with plant life. You know, when you eat something, a lot of them has to do with dealing with animal life. Um, Descola has this wonderful description of an indigenous person who gets access to a gun and kills more monkeys than he th thinks later on he should have. Uh, and these are all societies with built-in injunctions, which in a modernistic term, you can think of precautionary principles uh, that actually contribute to sustainability of these societies. But you know, I was I was wondering too, uh, to the degree that uh, the urban uh, history engagement with environmental history um, and the idea of infrastructure, but also uh, the deeper the deeper engagement with uh, rivers, with, uh, in fact, the coal-based economy, the carbon-based economy that we function with, the way that we use primary resources, the impact of urbanization on the environment and on the natural world, um, on a deeper ecology, gets us closer um, to the ideas that you're, that you're thinking of. Um, I know we have some urban environmental historians with us today, so it would be great to have them comment on that. Uh, Stefanos, I also wondered if you wanted to uh, react to some of what Depeche was uh, was um, reflecting on, which was absolutely so wonderful. I was really fascinated. I was fascinated by a lot that you said, uh, Depeche, but I wanted to just pick up because it seems to to play nicely to what I had in mind before. The sort of the smallest gesture, the touching of the feet. Um, as one in which suddenly entire orders depend, not in a way where the whole, you know, the whole world will collapse if you don't do it, but an unclear, you know, uh, world of authority and tradition is is unclearly, but in an impactful fashion, uh, being, you know, disrupted in this mode. Those are the kinds of things that I'm uh, that I'm most often uh, yeah, absolutely fascinated about. I totally agree with you. And that's why I brought in the distinction between the figurative side of what you want to be and the discursive side, the conceptual side. And the conceptual side is much less problematic. Yes. Uh, yes. And, uh, than the figurative side. It's, it, but but these kind of micro histories of changes and uh, including their lack of clarity. Yes. Uh, it's in these openings that you actually have no unilinear flow of time. Time is connected with affect. There's the affect of rebellion. There's the affect of my father being upset. The gentleman feeling insulted, whose feet <laughs> using to touch, and then at each other too. <laughs> and, and they're all connected. I and I, I'm also able to kind of feel what my father is feeling. I'm able to feel mm -hmm. what my, this gentleman is feeling, and I'm kind of also at the same time feeling triumphant that you know these mm -hmm. are 
these are well-deserved whatever punishments <laughs> what they've been doing for ages. And and it's in these moments that what I call history too, so, you know, I mean, the, yeah. the multiple belongings find their time within the empty time of modernity, modernity, mm-hmm. modernity. Mm-hmm. And both to understand that moment. Yeah. And the second little reference that I would make, which I think the urban link to this will be clear, um, has to do with, with the moment when you said, you know, there, there are various moments at which it's known. It isn't really about the universal anymore. It's about a kind of, and it isn't a particular, it's a kind of strange in between us in which certain things get, um, one appeals to certain things. And at the same time, what that means is not entirely clear. My classic, my sort of standard reference um, is that the, uh, the place where I grew up has moved uh, in in Cephalonia in Greece as part of the seven islands to the west of Greece, um, those were never Ottoman controlled really, um, and had been under Venetian control. Then had a short period of independence as the Septinsular Republic. Then the British came in and took over. The British, whom they considered, um, you know, absurdly outdated because they had no understanding of the local trade systems, thanks to which these islands had become rich. Uh, who built new cities or, or vastly expanded cities in order to counter existing systems of local authority. Um, and from the Seven Islands all the way into the mid 20th century, they were given to Greece in the 1860s. All the way into the 20th century, people would very openly object that they were um, like obliged international project that was far more traditional, far less politically forward and that they were forced into it in a kind of series of not really colonial but not really that different either uh scenarios in 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 the way that they would um experience it so that the greek connection is of course something that everybody learns at school and at the same time you know um what what one learns is that one is very special by comparison to that and was once upon a time much more modern everybody else had made them uh, out to be. Those kinds of local competitions, I think, become and uh, odd varieties of memory. Nobody would really, what are you going to do? Like support a, a, a particularism of a place that hasn't had it pretty much ever as a kind of elaborate, not even nostalgic fantasy of, of how this would work. That I think is fascinating. And I think that that could work in you know, these these multiple temporal dimensions and multiple paths work not altogether wrongly with what, uh, Rosemary, you were referring to as the sort of ghostly past that, that, that sit with the city. Everyday life is obviously very clear there. Nobody is, is going and saying like, oh, if, if only we'd figured out a way out of that, uh, 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 out of British semi-control of the island or of the earlier authorities and so on and so forth. But but there is a clear way in which um, those scenarios, whether explicit or not so explicit, uh, play a role much in the way that locations within cities or you know business districts, industrial spaces and others try to, and not to say nothing of neighborhoods, try to construct particular characters, which then are in some ways at war with the city itself. The city of London would probably be the most obvious uh, cases. What is London really? Um, and which then compete with all sorts of, again, I keep saying juridical, economic, and other technological, absolutely, uh, ways in which a place is, is structured and defines the lives of those living with them. So actually there, you see, um, it's very hard to think about the what we call the global today without cities and technology. And, and 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 what happens is having very big cities, these mega cities, or uh, even the the slum cities of you know Davis's description, it 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 then produces a certain kind of logic for the production of food. We have to feed all these people, and 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 the, and the point that Paklov Schmil, the Canadian researcher, makes is that it would be, and I'm coming back to. Rosemary, your point about fossil fuel and its centrality to this whole question. So it's like a you know Tim Mitchell point as well. Is that he's I mean he argues, and I don't know if he's right, he said without 
ammonia and artificial fertilizers and pesticides. If you, if you didn't have that, given that most people live in, you know, from 2007, more than 50% of humans live in cities. And the prediction is that we'll become an urban dwelling species by the end of the century. And he argues that at the moment, if you didn't have artificial fertilizers and pesticides, 40% of humanity would go without food. So, so it's not, do you, not only do you have these big cities, it, it almost imposes kind of capitalist farming or some kind of mo the logic of modern farming on you. Now there's an interesting debate and I'm, I'm not a specialist enough to make up my mind on this. So this is what Buckler Schmil says, and I respect him as a researcher. Whereas clearly people who are in favor of degrowth and scaling back capitalism, scaling back population, think that there are other ways of feeding population. Some people would say, let's develop, you know, or adopt indigenous practices, which are more sustainable. But this, but the city question for me is tied to the question of population, tied to the question of modern agriculture, feeding these people. And therefore, the technological infrastructure, both of modern agriculture and of the cities, they're not unconnected. And when one of the fascinating points that, again, Mill makes in this book called How the World Really Works, he says, you know, people now talk about vertical agriculture in the cities, like, you know, rooftop uh, gardening or gardening in the city patches. And he said, they will mostly produce stuff that will give you nutrition, like herbs and things like that. But, but in order to get the calories from the grains that you want to eat, you still need the big farms, or you still need huge amounts of land, right? So, so the, the future of the cities, I think, is totally tied up with questions of food production, uh, questions of the role of fossil fuel, this technology and that's why that's where kind of the global and the and the planetary come together for me one of the interesting going back to the question of temporality one of the interesting things i i that was characteristic of what i call planetary time or reading earth system science was that the system that supports life on this planet works without necessarily referring to human experience of the planet. It's much older than human beings. And the microbes have a role, insects have a role, phytoplanktons have a role in keeping life alive. And that's, a, that's the basic condition for our flourishing. And, I, and, I, and whereas building such cities uh, sustaining, so being able to sustain through technology so many human beings over longer spans of life. I mean, the average uh, longevity sort of in 18th century was 30 years. Before the Second World War, it was kind of close to 50, between 45 and 50. Now it's gone to 70 human, because of our technological capabilities and cities, uh, uh, the capacity to keep houses warm. Uh, we have been able to reduce child mortality on which you know the demographic figures figures defend so there's a and this is where you know i was writing today in some other place i was saying you know climate change is both an urgent problem and a very wicked problem uh, because when we say when it when we talk about degrowth we talk about indigeneity if we don't think about what we need to give up the, the actual cost of saving human civilization. And that's why the, the aspect of time that's emerged for me as a critical sort of thought point is, is really what, um, uh, what you would think of as um, the French philosopher, the name escapes me now, ancestral, the ancestrality problem, the ancestral time. You know, those, time that exists without referring back to human experience of, of time. And that is deep time. Uh, Miyasu, right. Thank you so much. Yeah, Miyasu. So I think that. So this, uh, this question of ancestral time, uh, which is time of the planet, 
in many ways, but which is critical to our survival. And therefore our becoming cognizant and respectful of that time. While, while we pursue projects which are situated in global time, in the time of human institutions, in the time of human experiences, it's how do you put them together in order to eventually effect a transition away from the current state of things? And, and the, I also I, wanted to add, Depesh, to your your uh, pointing to population as the uh, essential issue here, the question of migration as well, particularly as it's related to cities, um, because we can expect, as we already see, migration to increase substantially. And you can make the argument that cities have always been dependent on migration. You know, this is not new. Um, the scale of migration is a different question. So perhaps urban historians, all of us, should be studying the city as a much more fluid entity, right? And think about the networks of labor, um, the networks of individuals, the networks of peoples um, who wander the globe seasonally, right? Uh, depending on uh, labor, as well as for other reasons, climate change being the ultimate lately, uh, as being the defining aspect that we should be thinking about uh, when we're when we're thinking about cities and the future of cities. Yeah, sure. Maybe we should see if the questions. Yeah, yeah. Dorothy? Yeah, if I may maybe chime in on your point, uh, Rosemary, because uh, I think, you know, I'm, Depesh, I work on uh, seasonality in the urban, um, and uh, and I think you know the the reading that you gave, I can I can follow uh, that. Yes, we don't have to be scared of wild animals anymore, and maybe you know we are freed from seasonal pressures in comparison to you know maybe uh, a peasant in you know mid nineteenth century. Um, at the same time, I mean, my empirical work has shown that well, this seasons very much uh, still impact cities, right? And they've done it uh, all along. And it's actually more the reading of the city that becomes de-seasonalized, right? This understanding that technology will solve the problems of, you know, sort of uh, seasonal problems and seasonal, you know, sort of infringements, um, but that the actual experience of people uh, shows that while well, the seasons continue to be very important, uh, be it for cultural experience, like you said, war, um, we see this throughout the 20th century, um, you know, war intent, still very, very important, uh, the seasonal aspects. Um, and, and also when we think, you know, my project compares 1900 and 2000, sort of that roughly that area. And what I see in the 19, around 1900, it's very much a discourse about overcoming the seasons, um, very much in this kind of thinking about modernity, modernizing, you know, technology will solve all of this. Uh, whereas at the turn of the 21st century, it's much more, it's about climate change and it's about this realization that technology for one didn't solve the problem because it just generated a problem on a different scale, uh, being climate change. Right, because this illusion that we overcame, you know, any kind of uh, natural, you know, sort of infringement and dependencies uh, through technology is kind of hitting us, you know, from behind. Uh, because now we see it on a different scale. Right, that precisely what we've created in cities with urban heat islands, with all kinds of, you know, sort of uh, resource exploitation, not just in cities, but you know, on a planetary scale, right? Um, that that is getting back to us, you know, uh, with regard to climate change. So, and climate change also be an expression that has a very seasonal, you know, sort of implication uh, when things happen, right? Uh, that we have heat waves in the summer and we have, you know, uh, so I, I think the seasons, they are still very important and they have been uh, historically, but maybe it's precisely the, the narrative we like to tell ourselves about urbanization is something different than uh, the experience, you know, or the materiality of urbanization. Let's maybe put it that way. No, I, I totally agree. And in fact, uh, I, I remember a few years ago, there was heavy snowing in, in, in Texas, in, in Austin. And, and there was so much haha in, in Chicago saying, ah, they were not prepared for it. They only have, you know, two tractors or whatever, <laughs> two ice blowers. And uh, and like we were prepared for it, we could we could deal with it. So, yes, the, this idea that um, 
that we will still be able to carry on with what we do in spite of the seasons and we sometimes don't i mean i mean so you know if if the russian winter defeated hitler today we think i must make sure that the winter doesn't defeat me <laughs> i have this technology to do this so i think it was built into the nature of technology this desire to overcome seasons and what you're what you're saying in many ways is actually our experience that the, the planetary is far more powerful than what technology can do uh, but today with experiments uh, i mean cloud seeding has now become standard practice the, the chinese do it do, on the day of their national celebration so that the photographs show a bright you know bright and clean beijing uh, with their soldiers marching so it's become cosmetic but um, but yes i think as the weather's become more erratic and the, and the seasonality it becomes a more a question of more erratic random changes um we will have to adjust our aspirations and uh in it yeah sure but i i totally agree with you when you go back to the 19th century and read even um statements from the 50s it's very clear that um uh, humans are deeply appreciative of the human capacity to produce and control very high temperatures like in furnaces and very low temperatures as with air condition as with refrigeration and if you think of modern medicine like the capacity to both create the um, the the vaccine for coronavirus to store it to actually transport it from one place to another these are all dependent on refrigeration technologies and uh, so that's why i go back to the middle point that our lives are very enmeshed with this technology but we're also seeing the the gross impact of climate change and what it what it means carl you've been very silent um do you want to add some comments here and questions uh Thanks uh, for putting me on the spot here. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I appreciate everything um, they said, and I'm, I, I have to say I'm also um, feeling, you know, not on f firm ground with a lot of the concepts. But um, nonetheless, I guess it's sort of going back to the question of how could these uh, ideas about time be useful to us as sort of the time specialists in the room, historians, right? People who think about time and who think about it in space, which you know your second question really foregrounds. Um, I guess you know I, this could this question could uh, circulate back to Stefan Stefanos's um, uh, opening idea about power as well. Um, I, I don't hear as much. I hear about time, and I hear about the you know, the diversity of time, I don't necessarily hear so much about the shape of time. It feels to me that, you know, that that um, historians do like to think about things going uh, either very long or they're being bro broken in, 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 in sudden, sudden breaks. Um, so that's just one, one thing that I'm noting. Uh, what about, you know, what about disruption versus continuity? Um, another thing that's coming to mind is, is is causality so the imposition of power onto time what uh, how does how does that figure into to what what kind i mean causality is central to us to our, our study what so what what um what what sort of propels time maybe is another way of of of, of talking about that and then finally you know is it possible to um this is something that i've been playing with, you know, mix the three, uh, power, space, and time, um, and then come back to cities, because cities are often, you know, we often think of our of cities as, as the seats of power, or the, even powerhouses, um, and something that allowed us to do things that we wouldn't be able to do if we only lived in villages, for example, say, going back maybe even to Stephanus's prehistory or you know before there were cities 6000 years ago uh you know we we weren't able we were able to do lots of things um but you know somehow or another it feels like uh building a you know creating cities was in part 
as you said earlier, it's about to control, control our relationship with, uh, you know, the earth and the sun and all the, 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 um, the, uh, it's not just seasonal. It's, you know, it's about the amount of energy that comes from, uh, from the sun that we're trying to work out. How do we, how do we make that work to our advantages? So in some sense, cities were built as a place where we could exert more power over not only time, but space as well. I'm um, just and kind of cu curious of how, how these concepts might, how your, how your concepts might deal with, let's say, you know, causality and time shape. Um, I mean, I wouldn't have used, sorry, Depeche, if you want to go ahead first. Please go ahead. Please go ahead. I, I wouldn't have used the expression imposing power onto time. I would have used something closer to imposing a form of power as time or in terms of time. That is to say that it's, you know, it's it's very difficult because we're talking in vague objects in, in a certain sense. If we were trying to talk about the founding of a city and a life, let's say a kind of history of a city as a history of time, you would have to engage. So I'm just taking a, a, a an imaginary object in this, in this setup. You would have to consider just as Depeche was pointing right now, the provisioning of the city, the kind of regularity of that provisioning, the capacity of the countryside or of longer distances to sustain this, the elaborate apparatuses and, okay, the elaborate social apparatuses needed for sustaining it. Then you'd need to consider a kind of temporal history of infrastructure. There's just no escaping that sort of scenario. Then in what direction is it built? Is it built with a capacity to withstand snow or the flooding of, was it Dubai recently uh, or other versions? What is the imagined future that uh, this can go into and under what circumstances is this imagined future organized and regulated? Mm -hmm. Would it be possible to say, for example, that in many respects, what would have been a juridical set of decisions two centuries ago uh, today, for the megacities, for example, is much more a technological set of decisions that need to be made. The, the law will just have to follow because of just the vastness of, of you know, anything from, from a Mexico city to Singapore to, to, um, to an Abu Dhabi and the capacity, the, the kind of profoundly novel way in which this is supposed to be organized. So, and then you get into the whole you know, fantasy, the advertising, the come here for a life of the future, come here to be able to live the future scenario, or in other versions, you know, like, um, what is it, New York's newfound inferiority complex compared to uh, some of these other places, or what you would see regularly on other occasions. So if you were going to give a kind of the founding life and, I don't know, irrelevance of a city from Byzantium into Constantinople, and all the way to the present to something much briefer, like the work of uh, my colleague Andrew Needham on, on Phoenix and, and so on. If you were to design an object like this, then from my perspective, the question would not be a causal one. It would be a kind of mixture of layers of different possible temporal problems that you would have to engage, that you'd have to find out and engage and that more ecosystemy approach that I described in the beginning, that these are in a kind of competition. And on certain occasions, that competition really stands out. I think COVID was a very good example, both of you know, the, in the inability of you know, a medical system to function in a way where it could rule over uh, a city in the event of a, or rule over time also, uh, in the event of a pandemic and the presumption that it was actually really doing way too much uh, in so doing. That's for the the, the political side of uh, COVID regulations, if you will. So that would be for the public health uh, angle. So you'd have to consider how these different schemas are basically competing. Law is supposed to be forever and adding on, but technology is absolutely not supposed to be forever. And it has very different temporal structures as to what it's renewal and obsolescence and reorganization would be. So that's how something you would 
you would be constructing an object. But this is a totally imaginary object, and I have no idea that I would be able to ever do a project like this, or that what I've been describing actually makes sense. Yeah, I appreciate that. I think uh, just going back to the very beginning that where, where you started off by saying that without without the the hinterland, essentially what we call them, uh, the, the city would not exist. I mean, it's a very sort of uh, basic point. Um, and it, it also suggests to us that to me that, you know, cities are not the only urban spaces, because if we need villages to make cities, and they're at least partly uh, involved in the urban. Uh, they they deserve the adjective themselves. Um, but you know, at the same time that that city is required requires that it also builds more infrastructure, more hinterland when it when it as it needs it, as it grows, as it um, as it gains as it gains the as it gains the institutional structures within it that um, are required to make those kinds of gigantic, um, you know. But changes in the in the in the space, whether it's uh, you know irrigation ditches from ancient Sumer or um, today, where we need many more railroads or whatever it is, or bigger airports or whatever it is that we need to make that to make that transfer of energy into the city more uh, you know more sustainable, as you as you put it. Um, the, 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 the point I'm getting to, I guess, really is okay. So maybe it's not uh, maybe causal is is not a word that we liked so much, but how about how about dialectic? I mean, the, the two, one creates the other, the other, one creates, the hinterland creates a city, the city creates more hinterland, and so sure. on. So forth, we go. Um, sure. How does that, I just, I'm just trying to figure out how, how these kind of dynamics um, help us to understand the, the, you know, the, 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 the shape, well, uh, how, how, how they can be, in, how they can enter our, our idea of temporality of time. It's, it's, I'm, I'm, if I'm coming in, so as a historian, I, I feel that um, if one thinks across different scales of time, so for instance, if you're working on a city and it's say for the last hundred years, I mean, you would precisely uh, pay attention to questions of power, you know, how architecture might, be, or even cityscape might reflect power and possession and property and privilege and the taxation structure, all of those things. Uh, but if you took a longer view, when, you know, the details receded a bit and, and kind of looked at the difference between cities before electricity and after electricity, you will find that cities built before electricity city were much more sun conscious in in many areas they were much more they had to think about weather and sun and in, in particular ways i mean like when i in india traditionally this is called vastu shastra the traditional set of scriptures on how to build a house how to build a city uh, it's like feng shui from the chinese traditions right you will find that all these ideas of auspiciousness the directionality of, of a building which way it looks has to do with where light comes from, uh, where heat comes from, what would make a building cold? Is it always in the shade? You know, are there other buildings sort of towering over it? These were things that were very, very important. But once you have uh, kind of, uh, you know, bulbs that you can burn all day. And there are so many American apartment buildings where actually there are places like the corridor in a, in a railroad apartment or whatever, where, you know, you're actually burning electricity all the day just to get the light that you need. Uh, um, you go into a huge, you, 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 you're you looking for an apartment, you go into a building and you, and the difference between the one with windows that was looking outwards and the other one with not, the price values and, you know, these things often come in as aesthetics. But once upon a time, there were questions of heat and sun and all of those things that you need. And I think, that's why I go back to the question of scale. I mean, the scale on which you are, the scale of analysis is very important in um, in determining what insights you can get right. in, into the problem you're studying. I would echo that, the think... scale problem. I'll have to leave in five minutes. So yeah. I, I just have one little quick thought and then I'm happy to, to sit back, which is, and the scale then I'm thinking of, you know, also the work that anthropologists do, 
in particular cities. Um, the example that comes readily to mind is my friend Richard Backstrom's uh, study of brick fields in Kuala Lumpur, in which the particularity, um, you know, ethnic, religious, and so on, and in this case of a particular mix of a particular area, then is utterly determinant of its status within um, the, uh, you know, within the broader um, city of, of KL. And so uh, at stake becomes not only a question of sets of infrastructure, but a question of how it is that something like a neighborhood, you know, manages that infrastructure and both manages and responds to power arrangements of the city, of the state, and, and, and so on and so forth. So all of these scenarios really are a matter of scale, as, as Depeche says. It's, I, this isn't to deny your question, Carl. I don't think either of us is doing that. It's just that at some level, it's really tricky to come up with how to answer you if this is to be, um, if we're going to be making some suggestion that's pliable enough and agile enough to handle a different, a different space, a different. Right. If I may also yeah. add to that, that I think the more we live in cities, and I'm coming from again from the climate change problem and then the related problems, the more you realize how much more politically important cities are going to be in dealing with migrants, in dealing with disasters. Uh, and therefore, there's a political question of actually the city authorities getting more power given to them within the legal structures. And it's not just simply a matter of changing building codes. It's actually them having more political power. And I'm saying that because in India, there's a refusal by either provincial governments or the federal, we call it central government, to give to actually cede powers to city authorities. They are treated like cantonments or municipalities. Uh, and that, I mean, here the city authorities have a little more power, but not, not enough, I think, in terms of, the, again, the scale of the problem. So we kind of, and facetiously, I might say, the climate change will return us to the city republics in in some ways. Uh, that so that the urban government will become extremely important. I mean, we have, you know, Chicago has received about forty thousand Venezuelan refugees, and some of them indirectly in our neighborhood, and they beg, we encounter them going shopping, and it reminds me of a great title of uh, Lauren Berlant's book here that was published after her death called the inconvenience of others <laughs> which is the problem of the migrancy problem but um, but i don't think the city has enough power or authority to help them become part of the labor force uh, to equip them to give them the training to give them the skills so but whereas the city has to deal with that problem right so actually for me in terms of democracies how much Political power, decision-making power should evolve to the cities, I think will become a more and more important question. Um, this is, and I think this is a wonderful place for us to stop. It is, uh, we've been, uh, we've had a very full two hours. And uh, for those of you who have stuck with us here to the bitter end, um, thank you very much. And to Dipesh and Stefanos, thank you so much. This has been a wonderful conversation. I hope we can continue it. Um, and um, the Global Urban History Project is still very much here and involved. And um, and we hope to share with you going forward. Thank you very, very much for thank participating you. with my, us. My apologies for the technical problem. Oh, yeah. <laughs> thank it you. Was thank worth, you it was worth the wait. OK. Thank you. And thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you all. Bye. Thank, thank you, Rosemary. Thank you, Carl. Okay. And, okay, okay, bye bye, stay well. Bye. Bye. Let's very sick for a second. <laughs>